execute. The question is, how do you squat? A better question is, what is a squat? And to your body, it's, it's not a real thing. A squat is just a word, a mouth noise that we give to a particular way someone moves that we can find how they move. So we say squat like this. So we define what a squat is and then we put it in their head to squat and then they squat. But the squat didn't live in the person's head. Um, the person doesn't have motor programs ready to discharge. And we know that from dynamic systems theory research. And dynamic systems theory is really, if you're gonna learn motor control at any high uh, educational level, Nobody talks about motor programs. We talk about dynamic systems theory. We talked about we talk about how the way you move is it, it comes out of movement practice. So you learn to move. You're not given instructions. And when you learn to move, it's like a natural selective process. So let's say that you're you know you're born time zero. You have real no memories. You have no idea how to move. You're just given these twitch like reflexes, flexion twitches, extension twitches, reflexes um, that we call them. So the baby starts to use these reflexes, flexion twitches, extension twitches. It doesn't have a squat inside it. You see, it's just you just get these very low level spinal reflex type movements. And based on those type movements, after the the baby's born. The baby's clearly going to want to acquire things. That's really the, the point of a baby. They, they try to acquire things. They have to acquire food. They have to acquire shelter. They have to acquire uh, love. They have to acquire all of these things. So they start moving around. And when they move, it's really a natural selection process for movement. So as you move, if your movement that you just did was, was accomplished a goal or it, it produced a, a good outcome, you will upregulate the way you move. So your nervous system will select for that particular efficient and effective uh, motor discharge, which allows you to move in that certain way. When you try things and it doesn't work, you downregulate those paths. So it's, it's like naturally selecting for the most efficient ways to move. Now, this natural selective process starts at birth. So you might think that you walk because it's somehow programmed in your DNA to walk, but DNA doesn't program movement. DNA programs proteins. Um, so it's not like there's a walking pattern ready to discharge. You have to learn to walk. And the reason why you learn to walk is because with the anatomy that you're given genetically, um, the most efficient way to move with the bipedal posture that we have is to walk and to run. This is why babies don't continue to crawl or continue to butt scoot because it's much more efficient to get up. So I always say that if you take a baby and put them on an island by themselves and somehow they survive this ordeal, you go back 10 years later, you're not gonna find a butt scooting baby. You're gonna find a baby who eventually figured out, now it's a 10 year old, how to get up and how to walk because that would be the most efficient way for him to acquire or her to acquire food or anything else they need. So there's this constant thing. So now think of it when you're, when you're learning a skill. So I'm teaching someone how to throw a front kick. Never in the history of martial arts that would anybody tell you that if I show you how to throw a front kick once, that you're just gonna watch me do it and you're gonna know how to throw a front kick. You're gonna take in the information with your eyes, you're gonna take in the information with your ears, and then you have to take in the information from your body actually trying the front kick. So there's only really three ways to learn this movement. It's information coming in or information coming up. The information coming up is called afferents. Afferents is the information coming from all of your body's receptors that tell your brain how the movement's going. So if I throw a front kick, you're gonna watch me throw the front kick and you're gonna try to replicate what I just did. You throw the front kick once, I say, bad job. You didn't pivot your heel. You didn't, uh, you, know, you didn't twist your shoulder forward, whatever I say. Those auditory cues are gonna now downregulate the path that you use to throw that terrible front kick. If you throw it again and I say, good job, that was a lot better. You pivoted your foot, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm reinforcing the positivity of what you just did. You're gonna start to upregulate that particular path. This process goes on and goes on and goes on. And as people get more and more skilled, they select for more and more specific ways to do things. So moral of the story is that movements are learned. 
via a natural selective process, and even more important to remember is the process is ongoing, meaning that you continue to naturally upregulate or downregulate or naturally select for or deter movements based on your activity. If now, the filter that we use to learn how to do this stuff. So I said it's afferents. It's the feedback mechanism from all of your little receptors in your body telling your brain how the movement went. The afferents comes from our tissues. Our tissues create our joints. Our joints are the movable bits in our body. So a joint can be defined as the space in between two bones that allows for relative motion between the two. So it's an opportunity in the tissue for us to move. So the space and the surrounding area of the joint, that's where these mechanoreceptors live as well as in your tissues. But the health of that joint is going to determine how clear the information is being passed into your brain. So if you ask me to perform a task, I'm going to perform the task. If my shoulder joint is healthy, meaning that all of the mechanoreceptors in my shoulder joint are actually functional, the shoulder joint is going to give the brain a very clear message as to what went on during the movement. If you give me someone whose shoulder is in pain, previous history of injury, labral tears, rotator cuff fibrosis, AC joint, chip, whatever the problem is, whenever there's tissue damage, the tissue that gets damaged contains mechanoreceptors. These receptors are just in your normal tissue. Now, if you start using these quote unquote dirty filters to learn movements, so if your shoulder can't move very well and you start moving around, the information your shoulder provides your central nervous system will not be clean information. It will not be accurate information. Why? Because there's dead tissue, scar tissue that's pulling in different directions. It's, it's making the body feel like it's in one position, but it's not in that position. So this information gets fed back and then you learn sloppy ways to move. So if movement learning is ongoing and movement learning is dependent on the health of your joints, then it behooves us to make sure that each one of your joints is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. If it's doing what it's supposed to do and you maintain the health of the joint, then you're working with clean and effective filters, meaning your ability to naturally select for movements will be heightened. You'll be able to find more efficient ways to do things. You'll be able to execute strength better uh, and you'll ultimately perform whatever movement you were trying to perform at a higher level because you're now at a higher level of learning than someone beside you who really doesn't have the capacity to move or whose tissues and mechanoreceptors are riddled with connective tissue scarring.